The Creative Psychotherapist is the official podcast of the Creative Clinician's Corner, a practice building resource for creative psychotherapists. TCP Podcast is the cast for creative, expressive, and experiential focused psychotherapists curious to learn how to design, build, and scale a thriving private practice. Your host, Raina Lombardi, interviews successful therapists about the tools and strategies they have used to develop creative focused practices. They also talk about the products, services, and side hustles they have developed using their knowledge and creativity to enhance their therapy practices, make a greater impact in their communities, and diversify their income streams. Welcome. Now here's your host, Raina Lombardi. Thanks for tuning in to the Creative Psychotherapist podcast. I'm excited to introduce my guest today. Her name is Carolyn Mello Makulu. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist, supervisor, and a board certified art therapist. She's worked in private practice in Austin, Texas since 2012. She helps individuals and families of all ages to overcome depression, anxiety, difficult life events, and trauma. She also provides MFT and art therapy supervision. Her past clinical experiences include residential foster care, psychiatric inpatient groups, outpatient art therapy groups, probation services, school-based therapy, and community mental health. Carolyn graduated from Loyola Marymount University in 2007 with a master's degree in marital and family therapy with a specialization in art therapy. Carolyn began the Creativity and Therapy blog in 2012 in order to provide resources and support for art therapists and other clinicians who want to bring more creativity into their work. Beyond the blog articles, Carolyn also offers online courses and in-person workshops about arts-based approaches in clinical work. She is the author of a guided journal of writing and creativity prompts called The Balanced Mind, a Mental Health Journal, Exploratory Prompts and Effective Practices, which recently went on sale at the end of April. So welcome, Carolyn. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's so great to talk to you. Um, so let's go ahead and start by, um, talking about, you know, in, in the introduction, you went into private practice in 2012 and you also started writing your blog in 2012. Was that purposeful or it just happened that way? That was actually on purpose. Yeah. So I, um, knew in 2012 that I was going to be moving back to Texas. I was in California at the time. Um, and we had made a decision that we were going to move, and it felt like a good time to start private practice with that natural transition of moving, that I could kind of either spend those months looking for a job or spend some months building a private practice. And so with that in mind, I kind of started looking into what should I do to get myself established, maybe start building a, a web presence so that it wasn't so, um, so difficult to get started with the private practice. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time, got the advice to start blogging. Um, and so that could have gone in two directions. It could have been either blogging content that clients would want to find. Um, but I, at the time, was kind of not sure if that was what I was ready to do. And so it's like, well, I'll just kind of start a blog and share what I know about art therapy and creativity and those types of approaches. So that's where kind of creativity and therapy came from was wanting to start doing something new, something that could maybe get myself a little bit better known, uh, share some of my expertise with other people and um, kind of grew from there. So. Wonderful. I think, you know, it's interesting when we think about, well, should my, my content be client facing or should it be more clinical facing? But oftentimes when we um, are making it clinical focused, it does bring in um, client readers too because mm -hmm. they're curious about what it is. And yeah, definitely. I've definitely found that, that there's um, as much as I write for other therapists, there's such a broad range of people who actually show up on the blog. 
and I'll get emails or comments from people that are kind of just looking for their own ideas for what can they do for self-care, what can they do for expressing their own emotions through art, what is art therapy, um, all those things. And then it's great when I can send those people to an art therapist too and say like, okay, like if you love this, then go find an art therapist and here's a link for how you can find someone to work with. Oh, that's um, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And now I kind of blog for both as well, because now that I, in the private practice, I try to blog on my website there as well. Um, but it's kind of, it's interesting to have the different approaches to kind of speak to both populations as well. Mm -hmm. So can you speak a little bit about kind of your systems and processes that help you to stay accountable for writing blogs consistently? Because I know I've talked to other people that have said, you know, I tried it and I just, you know, I wrote like a couple of things and then it just, it just died out. I, I just couldn't maintain that stamina and motivation. What have you found to be helpful? So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, a couple things that have been helpful for me. One is having like a realistic schedule for myself. So over the past, I guess, eight years now, the blog's gone through a lot of changes um, and the frequency that I'm posting is one of those changes for sure. So at first, um, when I started writing, I was ambitious. I had more time on my hands. Um, I had a new private practice that didn't have a lot of clients to start out with. So at that point, I could post something once a week and I had the time for that and it felt like a good way to kind of use my time. Um, and then along the ways, I had a kid who's now five, and so that <laughs> definitely changed things. There was a period where I wasn't writing anything for a few months, um, and those periods come once in a while where I have to kind of step back and take a break from it. Mm -hmm. But um, now about once a month is what seems to work for me. Um, but regardless of what that frequency is, kind of making a commitment to myself that there's some regular frequency to it. Mm -hmm. So that it's not just when I feel like it, but it's kind of a part of my routine that I have to actually plan for it. And so then once I have that commitment, like actually sitting down and writing in my calendar, this is my time for writing. And so I've now, well, not now, things have all changed, but a few months ago in this past year, Wednesdays has been kind of like my creative day. And so I don't see any clients on that day, but that's my day that I'm um, working on the blog, working on the course, um, was working on the book, that I kind of set aside that time and make it part of my normal weekly schedule. And oh, that's, that's been really helpful to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really important. I think when we're tackling larger projects like that, to realize that we definitely need to allocate that as part of our workday time. Because um, <laughs> it's easy to push things off to the weekend and then you're not getting downtime and, you know, or it's easy to say like, I don't, I need that time for downtime and I just don't have time to do it. And yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's part of what happened because it did use, at one point it was a weekend project and it was easy to make that weekend time or it felt like there was no time during the week to do it. And I really had to just acknowledge that that wasn't working anymore. And I did want those weekends back and you know, as we all know, self-care is so important. And so moving that, really acknowledging that it was work and it's part of my job and putting it into my regular work week has helped make it a lot easier right now in my life to do that. Yeah, I imagine too, you want your weekends to spend with your little one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So, yeah. so what, um, let's say, what, would you say is um, like three important elements of creating a blog that people are going to want to read? What would you say you like specific kind of um, strategies that you've used to develop your readership? Yeah, I think three things that are really helpful. Um, first would be to do a little bit of research about what people are needing or where there's interest. And so when I, when I started the blog, um, there weren't as many art therapy blogs as there are now. Um, there weren't as many kind of of those types of resources for sharing things. 
And so for me, it was kind of coming out of what do I want to share that I wished I could have found? Mm -hmm. And so that was part of how I gauged what might be helpful or interesting to other people was a little bit of when I was a new therapist, what was I wishing I could find resources for? What was I going and searching books for? Those kind of um, interventions and ideas and new approaches and things like that. Um, and so knowing that if I was looking for that, I bet other therapists would have been looking for that too. And so, you know, with that, and now part of what inspires it is um, other blogs that I'm seeing, books that I'm reading, trainings I'm going to. And I think all of those are ways to kind of say like, people are really looking for and valuing this information. So it could be helpful to share it with even more people. So um, I think another thing that helps a blog is, kind of really owning your own voice and what, um, what you want to share. And so if a blog seems like it's written by some anonymous person who's just um, putting content up there that they don't care about, I think that's not as interesting and engaging to people. And so, sure. I, yeah, so I think trying to write from a place that's comfortable, that feels like myself, um, while still sh sharing helpful information but putting part of myself in there. And that's, I always include my own art examples, um, things that I'm working on. I'm sometimes inspired to put posts that are about things going on in my own life, events that I'm working, um, part of. And so I think I'm hoping that people connect with the fact that there's a real person on the other side of this blog. There's a practicing working art therapist there as well. So I think that definitely helps when we're blogging to have that connection there. Absolutely. I think people are, people value the authenticity and the ability to connect on a human level. Um, and when you're showing your own work that you're doing and the examples and, um, you know, providing like little narratives into your life, um, that, that definitely, it, it builds the relationship with the reader versus if you're reading something that's more like a clinical text. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily yeah. develop a relationship with the writer as the reader, but mm -hmm. the blog gives you that opportunity to, to really develop that relationship. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and then I think another piece of helping make a blog successful is looking for those other ways to connect with people. So having, um, having an email list where I can share when a new blog post goes up and I can email people and then they can email me back if they have questions or if they want to share things. Um, and then having the social media, Facebook account and Instagram account where I can share other things that I think are helpful. I can share the blog so that people can find them. I think all of that helps to build consistent readership and it helps make it easy for people to keep coming back when they know that there's those good resources and then they have a way to kind of be connecting with and finding them easily. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think you, you mentioned both email and social media. And um, when you think about um, which has more value, I think your email list has more value because you own that where when you're on social media, the social media company owns that. And while they might, they, they like, they could go out of business or, or mm -hmm. like shut down at some point. And then like, where's your community where if you have built your own email list, then you can continue to take that community with you, no matter what happens with the social media accounts. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. I definitely find that. Um, and I find I have a lot bigger email list than I do social media following. So I think even though like Instagram is fun and I think it's great to like post all the, especially as art therapists, right. To yeah. post all these inspiring images of art. Um, not everyone's on social media. And so I think email still does have a broader reach in a lot of ways. And then, as you said, you have those, those connections forever and you can take it with you as social media changes. You still mm -hmm. have that way to connect with people. Florida Art Therapy Services is a proud sponsor of the TCP podcast. 
They offer art therapy for individuals and groups, as well as qualified supervision services and high quality experiential driven continuing education for art therapists, mental health counselors, and clinical social workers. Visit www.floridaarttherapyservices.com for more information. And if you're interested in becoming a sponsor of the Creative Psychotherapist podcast, we have copper, silver, and gold options. So visit www.creativeclinicianscorner.com forward slash podcast for more information. What have you found um, to be helpful to start building an email list? If you're starting a blog, obviously when we first start out, we don't have Generally, people don't have that. That's something that they start to build as they grow their content. Um, how did you do it? So it, it actually took me a little while to get started with it. And so I do wish I had started sooner. Um, so that would be my first piece of advice is go ahead and set it up. You know, so even if somebody is brand new to blogging, um, maybe setting up their private practice blog or another blog is to just go ahead and set up that email list, um, get an account, you know, MailChimp is easy to use. You can start off for free and that's what I still use. Um, and you can put that little sign up form on your website and start collecting those addresses as soon as you can. Um, and I think with that, letting people know why they should sign up, what's the point, what are you going to be offering to them? Um, especially, you know, I've noticed over the years, like people have have obviously gotten more and more protective of our email addresses as our emails fill up with more and more of these marketing emails. And so oh, I think yeah. people want to know that you're going to actually be sending them something that's helpful and useful and interesting. And so letting people know that when they sign up, what are you going to be using your email address for? And I think if you're letting them know that you're just going to be sending them blog posts once in a while, things that are helpful and useful, then they're a lot more happy to sign up knowing that you're going to be using it to share and connect mm -hmm. with them. Yeah. Um, and then another thing that um, has been really helpful um, that I put into place is creating lead magnets, creating some kind of downloadable content that people might want to print out. So um, when you have a blog post creating a PDF that goes along with that, um, you, you know, there's a lot of great programs that you can make a PDF look really nice um, and you don't have to put a ton of effort into it or have great design skills, um, but you can kind of take some of those action points from your blog post and put them into maybe like a little one page sheet that people can print out that helps to remind them of the content. If there's an activity in the post, you can create a PDF that creates a worksheet or gives a little outline of the activity. And then asking people to put in their email address in order to get that PDF is another incentive to encourage people to sign up. Yeah, absolutely. I think mm -hmm. that those are great. That's a great way because you're, you're exchanging something of value mm -hmm. um, for that information. Yeah. And then I always try to let people know, like, if you're, if you don't want to be on the email list anymore, or if you want this PDF download and you don't want to be on the email list, that's okay. Right. Um, and so I never want anyone to feel like they were tricked into it. And I just hope that they feel like they're getting something valuable. And I think as long as you are sharing valuable, helpful information with people, then they're happy to be on those email lists. Yeah. Um, I, and two, I think when you're collecting them that way, you, it's voluntary. They're they're taking the initiative to provide you that information, mm -hmm. which demonstrates that they're interested in what you have to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is great. And how frequently do you email um, your listenership or, or readership, I should say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I... I generally email whenever there's a new blog post up, I'll send out a real short email that just lets people know what the topic of that blog post is and get, then give a link to it. And then otherwise, I just send out an email once in a while if there's, I think, something that would be helpful to share or something that I'm promoting. So if I 
have the online course opening up for registration, then I'll send out an extra couple emails about that. Um, with the book when it came out, I sent out some emails to share about that. Um, or once in a while, if I'm participating in something like um, an extra training or a wellness conference or something like that, I'll send out information about that. Um, but I don't, I don't, I know some people encourage emailing more frequently or once a week or that kind of thing, but right. I'd rather just send out an email when I have something really helpful to share and try to limit those emails as much as possible so that I'm not just filling people's email up for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I've heard different feedback from different people. I, um, this earlier this year, I heard from somebody they're like, Oh no, I, I do it every day. I was like, Oh my gosh, like that, that, gives me anxiety even thinking about what what could I create and say every day mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, so it's good to know that you know just because you create an email list it doesn't mean that you have to have you know something that you're sending out every day or every week that it's you can just send it out when you have something of value to share with um, with your readers and your audience um, and I think too, like that might actually encourage people to open your email more if they're, if it's not in there so frequently, like, oh, like there she is. She must have something interesting to say. I think so. I do. Cause I know personally when I get someone emailing me a couple times a week, it doesn't always feel important to open it. Right. right. It just feels like, oh, well this may be just more of the same and I don't necessarily have time to get to it, <laughs> but right. if it's something that I'm just getting once a month or even I know some therapists um, locally that send out like a quarterly newsletter and kind of share some helpful resources, does I always open those because I haven't seen these in a while and it seems like there might be something more, more essential, more worth sharing mm -hmm. in those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More thoughtful. Mm -hmm. So, what would you say are the benefits that you've experienced in your business and practice as a result of um, really being consistent over the years with your blog? Yeah, I'd say there's definitely been a lot of things. Um, when, when it comes to like my private practice blog, I've definitely found it to be really helpful in bringing clients in. And sometimes that's been people that have... Um, come across an article, maybe on Pinterest or somewhere else, and come to my private practice through an article or um, a blog post. But a lot of times it's also people who are just searching for a therapist in the area, and they're looking at different websites. And when they come across a blog article that really resonates with them, it helps to let them know that this is a good fit and that I could be helpful mm -hmm. for them. And so I think that's when we're thinking about therapist blogging, especially for private practice, I think that's the hugest benefit that I see is when a client comes across that, they're able to get some information to feel like they're able to get some help and feel like they can kind of connect and get a sense of who you are and then want to pick up that phone and connect and start working together. Mm -hmm. um, cool. And then with the, um, with the creativity and therapy, it's been a really neat way to um, kind of connect with a lot of people. And so to have people email me and say that articles were helpful, to have other therapists reach out and say that they appreciated getting the resources, I think has been so neat to, to really get to, to know and meet people and it, through, this, um, through the blog and through connecting in that way. Um, and that's led to kind of participating in some neat, um, neat projects, um, online conferences and summits and things like that. Um, it's opened up opportunities to um, be interviewed. So I've had journalists reach out and want some information for articles mm -hmm. and they found me through the blog. And so that's, I think, been a neat way to kind of increase what I could share with people in that way. Um, and then it's helped open up kind of um, other opportunities like to put together the online course. And so having a lot of therapists coming to the blog, wanting more information, wanting more resources and training opportunities kind of encouraged me to start this course so that I could share information with people in another way 
and then kind of a deeper, more thorough way as well. And so that's been kind of an interesting and fun thing to do with my business that I never expected to be doing. Um, and it's been something that I really enjoyed having. I love that that particular um, aspect of going into practice for yourself is like, at first you might have this very specific image of, oh, this is what I'm going to be doing. This is how it's going to work out. And then as you start plugging along, this leads to something over here or something over there. And, um, and you find like, oh, I, I can do this. And this is like fulfilling in um, a professional way. It supports what I'm doing with the therapy practice, but also provides additional um, streams of income too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely have enjoyed that about private practice, that going into it, I thought it would just be like, I'm going to go and I'm going to see clients in an office. And then to, uh, I feel like now I've like do all these different things. And I love that. I love being able to kind of put my energy in different ways and um, just kind of explore and experience different aspects of the business. Yeah, the the creativity piece. Um, I I think as creative arts therapists in general, like I think our brains might be more programmed to always be thinking about what am I going to create next. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely <laughs> find that, and I'm always like explore, like think of all these things I could be doing, and then it's like oh, I need to narrow it down and just like pick a few to focus on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And you mentioned that multiple streams of income. And I think that's another helpful part of having different aspects to our business, right? Is by doing the online course, by seeing clients and supervising, I kind of have these different parts of the business. And so there are times where one might be bringing in more income than the other, but it kind of all balances out over time. And I feel like it's you know, it helped me feel a lot less stressed about bringing clients in the door and always keeping a perfect full caseload because I do have this other part of my business and I can do workshops and trainings. And that's another way to kind of feel like my business can be stable and productive. Absolutely. I I agree a hundred percent that it helps so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It can be a lot of work up front to do some of these other things. (laughs) But it's nice then because you can do all the work at one point and then maybe relax a little bit more in another point. So like last summer, I my caseload pretty much dropped to half with a lot of clients taking vacations or coming in less often. But that was okay because I was also running the course at the same time and I could spend some of that extra time like hanging out with my son or catching up on other parts of the business and um, kind of just be okay with where things were and enjoy my summer a little bit more. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely know my caseload always shifts a little bit in the summertime too. Um, and I look forward to that. I look forward to not working as late Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. And just the lighter load of, um, you know, not seeing as many people, but with the other, if you're doing the other things, it, it, it's like you don't freak out because, okay, yeah, I might not be seeing the same number of cases each week, but I have these other things over here that are still bringing in income and it, it all balances out and it, it's not as stressful, like you said. Oh, right, right. That balance. So you know, some of the benefits that you noted for blogging would be that it, it definitely helped you connect with um, kind of ideal client and um, allowing them to see that you are the right fit for them based on how you are writing and what you are writing about for your practice blog. Um, but then for the more clinical um, therapist focused blog and the creativity and therapy that opened a variety of different collaborative opportunities for you professionally, which I, I think anytime we can collaborate with others, um, it provides so much opportunity for growth and um, to allow other people to hear your message and expand um, in that way, which is, is great. And um, 
also like, again, you go, okay, well, I'm going to go to this offshoot over here and try this now and see what happens. Um, and then it also allowed you to develop the course, the online course, which I do want to spend a few minutes talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, I, cause I'm curious about how do you do that? Are you um, using like a specific platform? Um, are you doing it webinar? Is it through Facebook? How are you structuring your online class and how did you kind of figure out how to do that from never doing that before? <laughs> so I'm using a platform called Thinkific. It's very similar to Teachable. Um, and that allows me to upload a variety of things to the course platform. So I can put videos um, and PDFs and then also just other written content. And then there's a discussion feature where people can ask questions and then also post their own like responses. And I have them post their um, pictures of their art that they're doing as they go through the course as well. So that's been a really helpful platform. Um, it's definitely very user friendly because you can kind of just create the videos, create your material and upload it all. And it helps the, um, the students taking the course kind of just walk through it piece by piece. Um, and a lot of the presentations are PowerPoints that I'll then just do a voiceover recording as I go through the material. And then each piece has um, an art activity that I have people do to kind of give them um, you know, a chance to try the art, to experience what it's like, learn a new technique, um, maybe do some self-exploration, and then share that with the group as well. So, yeah, and figuring out how to do it, I would say kind of just jumping in. Um, I, t I, I did uh, sign up for a few other courses that I thought might be good examples mm -hmm. and kind of saw how were other people doing it. Um, I took Lisa Mitchell's course that she used to offer on creativity and that was a really helpful example. Um, so just kind of seeing what other people were doing and what did I enjoy as I went through the process? What did I maybe want to do differently? And then kind of crafting something that I felt like would be a good fit for what I wanted to offer. If somebody else was thinking about creating an online course as part of what they were doing in their practice, what would you say um, is kind of the upfront time that you had to invest um, to execute it? In my mind, it seems, I've not done it before, but it, it seems like a lot of upfront work, a lot of hours. It definitely can be, um, and I honestly couldn't even tell you how many hours it took to get the course set up. Um, but again, like the blogging, it was something I kind of built into my schedule each week and then just started working my way through it. And I really, um, and I actually, so I started the course by doing also an in-person workshop of the same material. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a really helpful in that direction because then I kind of created my outline, figured out roughly the material that I wanted to go over, and then um, had that all set up and had people coming in. And we did um, six weeks through this, uh, six workshops. And each week I would kind of get the next set of material ready, have the handouts, have the presentation ready to go, um, and then test it with my workshop participants, see how it went, and then I could kind of tweak anything that I needed to, and then go and record those videos before I made the online course. And so that was, I think, a really great way to get started with it, and I would probably do that again for other material. Yeah, no, that sounds like a, a wonderful method. You get the market research piece of like, how are people responding to the material, mm -hmm. and you're, and especially with your um, when you're in person versus the on online, which um, in my experience of taking like some online courses, there was like virtually no interaction with the person that created the course. It was all, um, you know, on online um, through whatever portal system that they used. So to be able to have the direct feedback from your live audience, I would imagine that was really helpful. It was definitely yeah, very helpful to have. Mm -hmm. 
but also helped me kind of get a sense of how long does all the material take to present? Um, did it feel thorough enough? Were people confused about things? And I didn't have to do all that upfront recording and preparing everything for an online platform only to find out that it needed to be changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Then there's things I would probably change about the online course now. Um, and, but I think, yeah, I definitely had a lot better basis doing that first with the workshop. Yeah, no, a very, a very efficient way of doing it too, because you're doing it simultaneously. I like that idea a lot. And with the think, think, if it, think, if it, mm -hmm. think, if it, um, is that something that then becomes um, like embedded on your website or is that some like a different kind of um, the the person signed up for the course would have to go to the Think Ific website and, and do it, it from there? It is a separate website. So the way I have it on my website is that there's kind of a course page that shares what I'm offering and when the next time is that the course will be available. And on that page, there'll either be a live link that goes over to the course page um, where people can learn more information um, and sign up. Um, or there's also kind of a sign up link to get on an email list to be notified when the course will be offered again. So, and then people can click that link. They go over to my Thinkific page that I set up and that page kind of goes through more information about the course and gives them that chance to sign up. And that's where they go back to log in and everything is hosted on that other site there. So, okay. Very yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. cool. So the downside of that for people to know is there is like a monthly fee. And again, all your content is living somewhere else. But for me, it was worth it so that I don't have to learn all the tech details of trying to embed a course into my own website. I can, I can completely and totally appreciate that. I, um, I have two websites, one for my practice, one for um, the Creative Clinician's Corner, and both of them are different and it every time i have to go in on the back end i'm like oh am i gonna mess something up like <laughs> i have people to help me with it but sometimes i'm doing stuff on the weekend and i'm like i really want this done now i don't want to have to wait for them to receive my um you know help message to like update this or change that i just want to go in and, and manage it and it and it is it's like it's such a challenge. I feel like a, a huge learning curve in that department. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And I, yeah, I, I'm glad that I've learned so much stuff about websites and course platforms and all of this stuff. And I think it's all, it's all learnable, right? There's so many tutorials and resources out there, but, but yeah, sometimes it can be a lot. And then there could be just so many little details, but mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not always worth it to do it ourselves. Oh yeah. Like it's fine to go in and like edit some text off, <laughs> but mm -hmm. to do something like Im embed a course, I, I would need a lot of tutoring on how to do that. Um, but I know that there are some websites now that are being created like a prefab um, type website that can have those options within it um, so that it's not as challenging with like the HTML code and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That um, definitely seems helpful. I know my, the, my blog now is on WordPress and I kind of have figured out a lot of those things myself, but early on it was on Google blogger platform because it was easy and it was so straightforward. And so I always think like if people can do something just to get started, then it's great to have all these options. You know, my private practice site is on Wix because again, it was drag and drop and it was easy totally. to figure out. And I don't think I could have done all the WordPress stuff at that time. Um, so it's nice that there's all these um, options for our websites to kind of have these things built in for us. Yeah, I think too, it, it's kind of like, um, it's like that, that thing about mastery, you know, once you start um, 
you learn how to do a simple skill, like you get the assist from the drop and drag of the website. And so you feel a little sense of mastery, like, okay, like this isn't so bad. I can maybe figure this out. And then, um, and then you can start to, I, I think maybe feel more open to take bigger steps with things like WordPress, which is significantly more complicated mm -hmm. than the, the drop and drag website. But having had success with the drop and drag, it allows you to be like, okay, if I could do that, I can do this too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so I know um, one of the things that we haven't talked about in terms of what the blog has um, helped you to accomplish was to write the book that was just published. Can you speak a little bit about how the book evolved um, from that process too? Sure, sure. So I, it was something I'd been thinking about for a little while. Um, and I think having done the blog for so long has helped me feel a lot more confident in being able to write and speak and share my thoughts with other people. And so I had started thinking about what I want to write a book and what would it be about. And that's kind of just been an idea in the back of my mind for a little while, but wasn't really going anywhere. And then I actually had um, the publisher of the book reach out to me and ask me about writing a book. And oh, that was cool. Yeah. And so that was because they had found the blog. And so the publishing company that I worked with, um, they put together proposals for books themselves where they see kind of a need in the market something that they think would be helpful for people and interesting. And then they go and look for the authors for these books. And so they came across my website when they were looking for art therapists to write a book. And um, I got connected with them that way. So it was really neat to see the way that that kind of, I was in a place where I was ready for it. And then the blog is what kind of allowed me to connect with someone to make it happen. That is so cool. In, in one of the earlier episodes on the podcast, I spoke with Rachel Brandoff and Angel Thompson, and they um, wrote a book on uh, art therapy, like budgets, <laughs> like a create, creative um, interventions on super low budgets. I, the, the title of the book is really long, um, and I don't remember the exact name, but that, that they had said something similar where um, it wasn't writing the blog, but it was actually doing a presentation at a conference that a publisher happened to be in the audience, really liked the idea, and then came to them and asked them. So um, that's interesting, you know, how, how that can happen mm -hmm. um, just by putting yourself out there and being willing to share your expertise. Yeah, yeah. And then it was great too, because writing the book was a lot less daunting because I had done all this writing on the blog. And so it, first of all, made me feel like it was doable for me to sit down and write that much. Um, but there was also a lot of material on the blog that could then go into the book in different forms. Um, mm. Since the book really, I mean, a lot of it is things I'm talking about with my clients. It's art therapy or um, self-care art activities that I'm already encouraging and suggesting. And so some of those things were already on my blog and I could kind of take some of those ideas and material and then rewrite them for the book format as well. Wonderful. So you were, it, you're more editing um, in a way. And yeah, yeah. And, and filling in the holes. Yeah. And adding some more, but it didn't feel like I had to start completely from scratch with this big overwhelming, what do I write in a book type feeling? Yeah, I, I've only written some chapters and, um, and that felt really daunting just to write one chapter, um, to the idea of writing an entire book. I'm like, oh my gosh, that, it sounds like an overwhelming process. I know it doesn't have to be if you scaffold it down and break it down into small mm -hmm. chunks and stuff, but definitely intimidating, mm -hmm. um, did you use the same approach as you were already using to um, do your other creative activities? Like you were saying earlier that you have Wednesdays blocked off to, to do writing or other um, creative work that you do? I did. Yeah. Yeah. So it definitely was helpful to already have that built into my schedule to know that I had these days that were kind of set aside 
to work on projects and write. And so I use that time. Um, it did definitely take extra time. So that was a project where there was some extra weekend work and time spent doing it when I wouldn't normally be working. Um, but things like that, I think they're energizing to me. And especially if it's a short burst, you know, knowing that it's just a few months that I'm spending on this writing project. And the book actually had a pretty short turnaround time frame. So, which meant a lot of work per week, but a really short focused period of working on it, which actually worked pretty well for me. So I enjoyed that. Interesting. So that's something to think about um, if somebody was going to tackle a project like that, having mm -hmm. the timeline to kind of figure out how to structure it. Yeah. Yeah. And really knowing like what works for you. Um, Cause there was actually a different book I had been asked to do first that didn't feel manageable with what I had going on, that it would have, it was a lot bigger project and would have required cutting down my caseload a lot more and really focusing on the writing piece. And I wanted something that kind of fit into what I already had going on with my life. Mm -hmm. And so um, can you speak a little bit about if somebody were to um, read the book, what would they find? What would they find in there? Yeah, so the, um, the book is a collection of journal prompts. It has um, both writing and creativity prompts. So some of the pages um, will kind of present an idea and ask the reader to write a little bit about their thoughts or feelings or how they might put a particular skill into action. And then some of the prompts are more um, art-based. And so giving a suggestion for a drawing or collage, um, and all the topics are around kind of supporting positive mental health. Oh, and so they kind of um, are broken down into prompts that are about um, expressing emotions and learning skills to regulate emotions. Um, there's some sections about mindfulness and putting that into practice, um, increasing movement, so exercise and walking and getting moving and supporting our mental health, and then also healthy relationships. And so some of the prompts are asking people to reflect on their relationships or think about how they could um, make changes or be more assertive or speak up um, and get support from people in their relationships as well. Uh, it sounds like it's really packed with lots of great information and um, opportunities for self-exploration. I hope so, yeah. I think and it was important to me to balance that um, kind of self-reflection piece with some actual action steps that people could take too, so that it's not just sitting and thinking about what's stressing you out and writing about it or just writing or drawing about your emotions, but also then what can you do next, you know? Um, so not the same as working with a therapist, of course, but a little piece of what a therapist might help support you in doing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And if, um, if people were interested in obtaining a copy of your book, where could they find it? So you can get the book at most booksellers. So it is on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, um, but also most independent bookstores have it in their online offerings as well. So it's e pretty easy to find online. Awesome. So we'll, we'll get the Amazon link from you and put that in the show notes. So if anybody's interested um, in checking out a copy, um, the link will be in the show notes. Great. Yeah. Is there anything else that you think would be helpful for listeners um, in thinking about kind of adding this online um, kind of content creation aspect to their business? Because kind of everything that you described today, you know, we started off talking about blogging, but that blogging really became an evolution of content creation in different ways, like with the online course and then um, creating the book as well. Any other um, tips or suggestions that you might have for somebody who's considering starting doing the same? I would just encourage people to give it a try. I think so what I hear sometimes from my associates that I'm supervising is this hesitation to start blogging that I, I don't know what I have to offer. What am I going to say? Um, I don't have enough expertise, but we all have something we can share with people, right? As therapists, we're very knowledgeable and helpful and we can um, 
we can share those things online. And so just trust yourself that you have something to say. Um, be comfortable writing in your own voice. Know that it doesn't have to be like a research paper or a school assignment. And to just write like you're talking to people and share what is important to you and what you think might be helpful. And then to kind of make a commitment to it as well. You know, I think if we just jump on our blog twice a year and hope that that's going to bring clients in, it's probably not going to be enough. And so setting no. a schedule for yourself, kind of making a plan to make sure that it's something that really happens, building that into your schedule and being committed to it can make a big difference. Yeah, I agree. I love that. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was great to talk to you. Yeah. If people wanted to um, find more information about you, the Creativity and Therapy blog, um, where could they find that? So probably the best place is my website. So if you go to um, www.creativityandtherapy.com, um, and that's the blog. And so it's got all those articles. And then there's a link on there to my private practice website as well for anyone who might be interested in seeing that. Um, and then I'm on Instagram and Facebook also as creativity and therapy. Okay, great. I'll put that in the, those in the show notes too. Okay, great. Before we wrap up, we had talked um, before about the possibility of listeners um, participating in a giveaway with um, an option of receiving your book. Yes. Yeah. So we have um, one copy of the journal as a giveaway for your, um, for your listeners. So you can have a sign up form for that and we'll be happy to send them a copy. Awesome. So we'll be putting that on, um, on the website and I don't have the actual backlink for it, but we'll add that in later. And, um, and then you can sign up and we'll do a raffle and, um, and give away a copy of Carolyn's book. So thank you so much for spending the time this afternoon. And I know you're busy and uh, I appreciate it so much. And I hope that the listeners do too. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was really good to talk to you today. You too. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Creative Psychotherapist. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For show notes, downloads, and additional resources, head over to the website at www.creativeclinicianscorner.com.